A while ago, I reached out to Thomas. He's a great follow on Instagram. And so I said, hey, you know, I don't talk much about gear. I don't know much about gear, but, you know, the audience deserves to know more about gear. And no one is doing a better job than Believe in the Run, in my opinion. And so I said, hey, Thomas, can you uh, join me for some podcasts? He said, yeah, I could. But, you know, who'd be better is Taylor Bodine. He's my lead trail reviewer. <laughs> So I've done a lot of episodes with Taylor and I tell you, it's like going to school in a, in a good way. I mean, I've been running, I've been wearing shoes my whole life. I don't, I haven't known much about it until these episodes with Taylor. And so one, one episode I threw out to Taylor was, Hey, why don't we, um, let's talk about the Dostler brothers. I think it's an interesting story to do Adidas versus Puma because they're both doing some trail shoes. They're both legacy brands. They, they have an incredible story, an interesting story. And he said, I'm not the one to do it. You got to go back to Thomas on that. So today, uh, I'm stoked to have Thomas Newberger join me. He's the founder of Believe in the Run, been doing it since 2009. I, I know just a little bit about him from our discussion before. I'm a huge fan of the aesthetic of Believe in the Run, the community that he's building, the events he's putting on. Most specifically, the enamel pins are incredible. Yeah. Uh, well, but Thomas, before that. we go any further, I'm glad that you're here. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I love kind of like the way that this community all comes together. And, yeah. you know, what Run Borderlands does is so different from what we do, but it's still serving people with the same kind of like interests. And I do yeah. think there is, I think it's great you're having Taylor on because he can really help people get the most out of their running experience. I think that, you know, you can show trail running and the romance of trail running and the, you know, the hard parts of struggling through some of these ultra distances or even just going up a short distance. It's up yeah. straight vertical. Yeah. And then Taylor can help, you know, help somebody make the right choice for footwear for oh my goodness, these yes. different races. Yeah. Yeah. He's fantastic at it. Since we've got you here, the, the founder of Believe in the Run, Taylor and I will talk about it and, and, you know, I'll give my take on how I perceive Believe in the Run, but will you kind of hit us with the high level? Like what is Believe in the Run? All right. So Believe in the Run just started out of like my fascination with gear. So when I was <laughs> younger, I was into skateboarding and it's kind of the same thing. I was never a great skateboarder, <laughs> but I had, I love the gear and I could yeah. put together decks and, you know, yeah. if you wanted someone to help put grip tape on your deck and do all that stuff, I was your guy. I could help yeah. you build a three quarter ramp. All that stuff was like nice. a lid for it. And that was in California? Problem. Yeah. This okay. is in uh, the Bay Area of California. Got it. All the Powell Peralta shirts, Santa Cruz, all that stuff. I was just oh, dude. Yes. TNC. I, nice. I live for it. And, uh, you know, later I kind of went away from skateboarding. And when I found running, I was like, I wanted that culture fit back into, like, that's what I was interested in running. I was interested. I, like, I loved running the miles, but I loved seeing the gear and what's yeah. what's new and what's exciting and color trends and that kind of stuff. So we started, uh, you know, on my own, I started like kind of experimenting with different shoes, seeing what worked. I was never like loyal to a brand. Yeah. Um, and we started in 2009 and just started, uh, talking about, I was actually training for trans Rockies that we talked okay. about. Nice. And I, I was like, man, this is an audacious goal. I just started running. So I'd done like one or two marathons and then I signed up for a 130 mile race. And I was just like, <laughs> A little scared so yeah. i was like let me get people involved that way i know i'll do it yeah and so i started doing my training online and actually was raising money for a charity and hmm. as i was doing that uh people just kept asking me oh what what poles are you going to use what this are you going to use so i started talking to people and then people started sending me oh you're going to talk about this and you got to think 2009 there's no instagram yeah. facebook is kind of like there right for runners, there was like one space and that was Daily Mile. I don't know if you remember Daily Mile. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah they're gone. But um, wow. Yeah. So Thought I started talking time. about this stuff and there was no place for these brands to kind of have like an independent outlet. Hmm. The only other person like Run Blogger was around Pete Larson, who uh, who was very much helpful to me getting started. Um, uh, and we kind of built up and then brands just started being like, hey, if we send you these poles, would you run with these poles? And I was like, leaky poles? Sure. Why not? <laughs> you know? And so that kind of started being like the impetus. So it started going away from me talking about training, which I thought people yeah. would be interested in to just the gear. And the more I talked about gear, more gear came. Yeah. People. Yeah. So 
it seems how, like within this whole world of, of media that gear is gear is where it's at. Like I was just kind of even thinking through like this idea of the customer journey with running and the, 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 the moment someone decides they want to run the next step is, is a gear. It's a gear inquiry on Google. What should I wear? What's the best shoe to yeah. do this or to do that? And I think, you know, just from my outsider pers perspective, that's where believe in the run. That's where you capture them. You capture them from the moment they decide they might want to start running. Yeah. Well, I hope so. Like, it's funny. We hear from, you know, people who work at the stores and they'll say mm. people will come in with their phone open with the believe in the run website up and, you know, looking to see what shoe they might want to get. And then That's awesome. the other side of it is, it's like, it, I don't, I can't tell someone how much a difference running in the right gear makes as far as making you feel good, yeah. making, making running more enjoyable. So like we yeah. hope that we're doing a service for people, even though we get a lot of complaints that we get people to buy a lot of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, you've, you've done a fantastic job. I, you know, I'm a big fan of the aesthetic. One of my, my biggest downfalls, cause I've never been a big gear person is that I've chose almost entirely on aesthetic and I've run, I've run, tried to run a hundred miles in shoes that are too narrow, but I like the way they look. And so that's my problem. Yeah. Uh, but I think, so your aesthetic has, has been great. And that's to me, that's, you know, that draws me in instantly, even if a majority is road and I'm not running the road, I'm still always interested in the photos and, and, you know, the, even the, the visual of your, uh, of your video podcast and everything are fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it, it all started out originally, like I said, you know, in 2009, me kind of working solo, Megan yeah. came on a little bit later. Um, mm -hmm. she's probably been around 2012 or so. Oh, wow. And then, um, you know, the addition of Robbie, he's just such a talented writer and he's yeah. a creative guy that helps me kind of like, uh, bounce creative ideas off of, and we kind of mm. collaborate on a lot of stuff to like, he's a, he's a really good partner. And then, you know, we've added people in like Carl, who's mm -hmm. great with the video. So now we have some, you know, he helps with filming our shoe reviews and also some of our long form, like recaps for the weekend or something yeah. like that. And yeah. so like it, it really is at this point, you know, it's, it's a committee project and we all yeah. work together and, and hopefully in the future we can find more people that can fit in there. And, uh, and we're even talking to Taylor about some possibilities. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, and you're headquartered in Baltimore. Do you kind of wear that as part of the identity of the brand too, that you're a Baltimore company? Yeah, I think it, you know, personality wise, Baltimore is kind of a gritty kind of underdog city anyway. Yeah. If you came here, you could fall in love with it, but a lot of people don't even give it a chance. Yeah. Um, which I don't know. One of the things that's great about it, like if I was in New York City or even like Austin today, the idea of having the balls to be like, look, I'm going to tell people what gear is good and I'm going to do that, it, it probably would have been intimidating. Yeah. You know, we, we started a running club called Faster Bastards. It's great. And would have I named it Faster Bastards if I really knew how fast people were when I <laughs> when we did it? But, um, <laughs> That's you great. You can be faster or you can be a bastard. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. don't have to be both. I like no, it. I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, here in Paris, you when you were here for the Olympics, I saw you post a photo that you went to the French Bastards. Uh, it's a bakery. phenomenal. Yes, phenomenal bakery. So every time yeah. I pass it, I think about leaving the run and you. So where I I'm from. I bought a t-shirt. The, oh, you did? Yeah. Perfect. They're like, do you uh, want any bread? And I'm like, no, just the t-shirt. Nope, just the t-shirt. <laughs> you know, uh, so where I'm from, uh, Friday Night Lights nailed. If you've ever seen the TV show Friday Night Lights, it is yeah. so absolutely perfect. It nailed my upbringing. How true is The Wire to where you are? Uh, I would say The Wire is probably true in a pocket of where we are. It's yeah. like, have you been to Chicago? I have not. Okay. Is sh Chicago is... Like, I remember they were talking about the murders and stuff that were going on there and the, right. you know, in certain areas. You don't hear, Chicago doesn't get a bad rap because they have a section of town where mm. there's gang violence and violence and drug related violence and all that stuff. Yeah. Chicago still stays like a shiny city. And the yes. same thing is with like New York. Like, yeah, if you probably go some places you shouldn't be, right. you're going to see some shit go down. Absolutely. Baltimore is the same. The yeah. difference in Baltimore is I, I grew up on the West coast and there you have a town, a little bit of space, the next town. And so you could be living in a really high income, nice place. And then yeah. you have to get on 
a highway to get to a place that's maybe a little more dangerous. Whereas on the East coast, because it kind of all happened at the same time, you mm. can be blocks. So it's like <laughs> where our headquarters is in Baltimore. Yeah. I, pro I probably wouldn't tell you to go four or five blocks in another direction. Interesting. You probably want to avoid that area. Yeah. But you know, it's not, yeah. I think it's just a different dynamic, but Baltimore itself is, is a beautiful city right on the water. I get yeah. to run every morning watching the sun come up over oh, the Chesapeake nice. Bay. You see wildlife. It's oh, beautiful. Nice. Well, I mean it as a compliment. It's back. It's always a, it, it depends on which I've rewatched most recently is Friday Night Lights, my all time favorite or is the wire. I mean, I can't, yeah. and that's brilliant. Um, it is a good show. show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So the real reason we're here though today, I'm curious I, I love this story of Adidas and Puma the, from the moment I heard it. I mean, it just, it's, 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 it's incredible. And I know there's books about it. People have done podcasts about it before, but why it's interesting to me also in the context of what I do with Borderlands is that they're, they're dabbling in trail. They're, I mean, more than dabbling, they're, they're investing in, in trail shoes and, but so two brothers, uh, Adi short for Adolf, and what Rudy short for Rudolph. So Adolf and Rudolph started these, uh, they were in business together and then they had a major falling out and then they went off of their own way. And I guess the falling out got even bigger. But to me, the bottom line, what's crazy is that one brother started Puma and another brother started Adidas. Maybe first question, do you personally say Adidas or do you say Adidas? You know, I try to say Adidas and here's why I know it's unpopular in the U S yeah, but and you sound like kind of like a pretentious prick, but um, <laughs> yes. But the reason I want to lean into that is the man's name was Adi. Like, fair. It's, that, me too. I, I'm with you on that. Yes, Adi Dossler. So, yes. like, to not say it that way is to say, like, if if I was to, you know, be like, hey, Jish, you know, it's like, <laughs> that's not my name. My name's Josh. Yeah, but, you know, it's like, yeah. So for me, I try to do that. And also out of respect for the company, you know, it's like, yeah. why not? Like when I go and they call it Nike in, in the UK, right? Like, no, it's, it's Nike. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Fair enough. You know? Um, all right. So what, 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 can you shed some light on that whole story? I mean, there's, I know there's, there's Olympics involved. There's all sorts of crazy things yeah, involved well, in that story. Do you, do you yeah. have a brother? I got two. Okay. You get along with all of them? Actually very well. Okay. All the time growing up. Smoothies. Growing up, yeah, my I, I I was a baby, and uh, I think I brought street cred to them because I could like they could sh bring me to a baseball game or something and I could perform. So we we got along pretty well. So okay, so you're not yeah. going to relate to this story as much. Not the same way <laughs> these guys. Actually, I can't imagine something tearing apart a family the way that it tore apart the Dostler family. I mean, my family hasn't been torn apart, but I've worked with my brother, <laughs> and we've had disagreements. Yeah. And it's funny because, you know, we talk about the Dossler brothers and, you know, Puma and Rudolph was very much the marketing and sales guy okay. where Adi was very much, I want to make the best product possible. Oh, okay. And so together when they were working together, it was great. You had one brother making the best product. Yep. You had the other one marketing and, and sales. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a perfect combination. Right. Things went south and we can get into that. But if you, the one thing that I always like to remember is like, everybody thinks that Jesse Owens ran in Adidas in the 1935 Olympics. Yeah. And he was actually running in the gate issue, which was that basically when, it's German for brothers with yes. both of them. Yeah. So, uh, Gated Dossler, uh, he was running in that shoe. But the oh, interesting, interesting thing is, and this I think did fall more towards Adi. Was he was like, I make the best product. I want it on the best athlete. Mm. And think about that. It was a black American athlete. Yeah. That couldn't sit well with Hitler when. Oh my goodness. I didn't even wear those about shoes. That. that was 1935. Yeah. I believe Dang. that's the date. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And um, so right, right before the shit hit the fan in Europe. Yeah. And uh, he's putting his shoes on who he thinks is the best athlete. Which to me kind of sums up Adidas's philosophy, even to this day. It's like, I don't care who it is. If they're the best athlete, we want our product on their feet, helping them mm. perform 
to the yeah. best of their ability. Yeah. Yeah. You see that at like the, the DNA, they say that, uh, no, no, long after the founder of a company is gone, the DNA will live on within that company, whether it's good DNA or bad DNA. And even the way that you just said product, Adidas was product and Puma was marketing. When I think of Puma, I purely think of aesthetic. And when I do think of Adidas, I do think of performance. I do think of product, uh, like higher quality product than I do perceive Puma. But I was perceived Puma as like this, you know, it's, it's style. Like it's, it, it looks better to a degree. Until lately, I, the, a lot of the shoes I'm seeing from Adidas are stunning that you guys have been yeah. posting lately. The, the, I mean, I, I can't think of a shoe that. Oh my gosh. I yeah. Mean, it's so clean. This one has a marathon on it and a 10K. Really? And it's, you know, it still looks pretty fresh for a white shoe, but like now, is that, the, is that, that the accessible super shoe that's more affordable or is that the super, super shoe? No, this is the super shoe. Okay. Uh, this is, oh, wait. Yeah. So if you're talking about the Evo one, which that's is the $500 super yeah. light shoe. Yeah. Yeah. This is the Pro 4. So this is the latest version of their. When you say accessible, it's still 250 bucks. Sure. Yeah. Rel yeah. Very much relatively yeah. speaking. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, and they actually just released a shoe that looks just like the Evo one. Mm. It's going to be available, I think later this month on a small release. Um, okay. It's called the Evo SL. And hmm. it's actually the super foam from the race shoe in a date, like a daily trainer slash wear out kind really? of casual. And it's, 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 it's fantastic. It's one of my favorite shoes. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So when, when these, the, the brothers had, you know, had separated, I, I heard that there was something about their wives not getting along. I mean, I heard that there was just a lot of problems there. I think there's two things. The wives apparently yeah. didn't get, get along, uh -huh. which again, if, if you've never been in a situation like that, they were sharing a villa and they had to live together basically. And yeah. they didn't like each other. So <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a problem that becomes a problem for the, for the husbands right away. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> the other thing that's cited is, so Rudolph was conscripted to the military. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, part of the Nazi party. And then after the war was tried by the allies on Nazi crimes and had to basically go into prison for a while. Meanwhile, Adi was running the business and doing all that. Rudolph feels like, Adi had something to do with him getting into that situation. I mean, why, I, I read that. Uh, why did they believe that? That's what I missed. Why did he believe that Adi had something to do with that? You know, knowing that the wives didn't get along, I'll bet you his wife was chirping in his ear. <laughs> like, hey, while you were gone, guess what? You know, Adi's doing great over here. Yeah. 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 Okay. So where, at, at what point, um, you know, and looking at the, like the grand time scale of these two brands, I mean, trail running was like, not until like 2000s, even called trail running or yeah. perhaps, but you know, when are these brands, I mean, they've, they've dabbled in lots of different sports. They've had lots of different, you know, evolutions of their product and expressions of their product. Uh, let's, let's just dip into trail for a minute here and see, like, help us understand what Terex is from my perception. Terex feels like it has a big budget. But from everything I've heard from you and Taylor and talking to other people, Terex and Adidas, uh, all they share in common is the name Adidas, but they don't share people in common. They don't share design teams. They don't share anything. So what is Terex? I mean, they, they do share some ingredients. Like we're starting to see in some of their premium shoes, some mm -hmm. of the same foams that you'll see in the road racing shoes, making it over into uh, the graphics and stuff like that. Okay. But Terex to me, this is just my perception of it, is a separate company. It's almost like a step sister, yeah. step a company to yeah. Adidas. So like you look at it and I was telling you when we visited Herzegova and went to the Herzog offices, it's a, Adidas is huge. It's like a college campus. Hmm. And there's like one building that does Terex and they're kind of like over there. We didn't interact like we got to see behind the scenes of all the stuff <laughs> in the running all, all that yeah. stuff labs pro athlete uh fitting areas the hmm. assembly testing rooms everything and they're like yeah that's Terex is right There's over Terex. here in that building that used to be used by the americans when they set up a base here in uh, <laughs> after world war ii which is really huh. weird there is actually a barracks that's now Terex office 
which was really? originally the main office of Adidas after it was built by the U.S. people coming in uh, as a barracks. Interesting. Yeah. So, okay. What what about with Puma? I mean, I don't like. I just like here in Paris. One of the things I love about Paris is that anytime I want to do a deep dive into a brand, there's a flagship store here, so I can go see it. Yeah. Even when I go into Puma, I don't get a clear understanding of of who they are exactly. How would you describe Puma generally? Not even necessarily Trail, and then so Puma in general, yeah. and then what are they doing in Trail? Sometimes I feel like Puma's a dabbler, mm. and they kind of like when I was first doing reviews, they they didn't really have a shoe line. Then they came out with something they called FAS, F-A-A-S, uh-huh. and the FAS line. And they came out with a lineup, and they were actually pretty decent shoes. I liked them a lot. Mm-hmm. And I actually ran a marathon in the Puma FAS 500. Uh, it, they were nice shoes. They looked great. And then they kind of started doing this experimental stuff where they were trying to create, like – unique shoes that they had proprietary, you know, tech in and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. They kind of like were hit or miss, like even to run in. But for some reason, the FOSS line just died out. And I, when I talked to retailers and stuff and tried to feel like, why don't you guys carry Puma? Why they said it's the distribution. We can't (laughs) get, get the shoes. And even today, I think they're still struggling with that a little bit in running retail. But before we get to that, so the FOSS line just dropped off. Yeah. And they kind of disappeared from running for, huh. for I, I don't know, close to maybe five, six years, just gone. What What were they doing? What was their core business? You know, I think they got really into the the lifestyle okay. uh, stuff. And yeah. apparently, yeah. you know, around the same time running came back, they started getting real big into basketball and some of the court sports. So... Hmm. Recently, a couple of years ago, they made a lineup of shoes that was like, I was like, wow, this is incredible. Puma's back. We've got yeah. some really good shoes here, starting with like the DV8, um, mm-hmm. Nitro DV8, and they started yeah. with all these Nitro foams. So they came back and they had a really nice lineup of everything from kind of like tempo shoes to daily trainers, but they kind of weren't quite there with the race day shoe. Mm-hmm. And I say that with an asterisk, even though Molly Seidel uh, won a bronze medal in Tokyo wearing the DV8 Elite. Really? I felt like it was a subpar shoe. Like you sh- really shouldn't have been like, hmm. it, wa- it wasn't a great uh, shoe for for Quick an elite qu- run. question on that. Someone like Molly Seidel, in, when she's running, I mean, is she, she's probably, surely she's not wearing the same shoe that I can go buy off the shelf, right? I mean, are they like highly customizing Per, no, they actually, you could, you could buy the same shoe. Really? There's only like, when we look at that, sometimes a uh, athlete might be testing new materials. Okay. And then you can see like, they'll have the list of shoes that the athletes are wearing and it'll have like a, like a little asterisk or, or a different name or, or, you know, a beta or something like that. Got it. Um, but for the most part, like in Chicago, I know that some people were testing, next year's iteration of a shoe that's going to be available to the public, but they're using the foams and that kind of stuff. And just kind of like proof of okay. concept. Okay. Um, okay. And so for the most part, no, I think that the Olympic shoe that Mata Seidel wore was the exact DV8 elite hmm. okay. nitro that you could get. Nice. And, and you, you know, thought that that shoe was just okay. Yeah. It, it, the foam that they were using in that shoe was just your standard uh, nitrogen infused foam. I don't know how familiar you are with foams, but that's a little bit. They're nice. It's just a different way of instead of compressed molding foam into a midsole, they heat up like a little puck and it almost explodes like popcorn, creating the oh. air pockets and the bubbles and stuff in the foam. Okay. Yes. And so it gets a really nice energy return, a bounce. It's a lighter foam because it's got more air in it. Hmm. Um, so they came out with that line. I, one of my first questions was, are you guys here to stay? And they were like, <laughs> yeah, we're committed. And wow. so, and they have been, and, and this is like the latest DV8 nitro. Nice. Okay. Um, three. And it's, it's a really phenomenal shoe. It really is. It's a great shoe. I still feel like their race day shoe, the elite version of this 
Mm -hmm. it's good. It's not top tier. Like I feel like the top tier where I, I do think Adidas beats them in the race day shoe category. What are their price points on that? What's the price point on the one you just showed us? Uh, this one? Yeah. I think there's 160. Okay. So this one's your daily trainer that has a plate. So you can kind okay. of see there, it's got the, what they call the power plate. Okay. It's a carbon resin plate um, with the nitro foam that we were talking about. And they keep playing with the foam formulas and getting them better. So they're bouncy, responsive. One thing that Puma has that's incredible is their Puma Grip rubber. Mm -hmm. It's as good as anything else out there on the market. It's not I like a Michelin collaboration or a Goodyear collaboration. It's their own thing. Yeah, this is a proprietary blend. Okay. Uh, and then Adidas uses Continental rubber. Okay. As their premium. Interesting. Premium foam. But yeah, this is a great shoe for daily training, especially if you like having that plate or a shoe that maybe you can pick up the pace in if you want to run some tempo miles in it. It's, it's medium weight. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. How would you define this very, very simple question, probably a uh, question you don't even bother with on your, your podcast. How do you define race day shoe? What makes something a race day shoe versus a trainer? Uh, I mean, it's pretty simple. There's like characteristics. Yeah. So first thing you want is weight. And that's why that $500 shoe is $500. It's the lightest on the market right now. Okay. There are a couple other brands that are bringing a wow. super lightweight shoe to the market, but okay. if it's just lightweight, that goes back to like flats, which, oh, yeah. you know, we had flats, they're super lightweight. They just didn't have any cushioning. Yeah. So then the next step is you want to have that cushioning, a foam that's light, responsive, plenty of energy return. But the best part about those things is like when you run a race now, like that old meme of people like hobbling upstairs after a marathon or, you know, being out for a week because they're limping because they ran a marathon. That's with the new foams that's gone because your really? legs. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you got to really, really throw down to, to get like <laughs> cranky legs. That's the incredible. Foams are so good and so protective now. Like I've run, I ran um, a OBX marathon in an Adidas shoe that uh -huh. was the Adia, Adido Boost, Adios Boost, which okay. was very thin. It's probably like 10 millimeters in the forefoot. Now okay. we're like looking at 30 in the in the forefoot and, and higher, <laughs> 36 even. Um, that thing, like when you when I was done with that marathon, like my feet were killing me. Like you yeah. can't wait to get them off. Now with these foams, it really makes a difference and the energy return. And mm -hmm. then you finish off with, what we consider race day shoe typically has some component of a stiffening agent, which would be a plate. Mm. In the case of Adidas, it's these power rods that they like to expose, huh. but those come up almost like metatarsals mm -hmm. in uh, your foot. <clears throat> so there's some stiffening agent that is giving you some rigidity and pop off the toe. Okay. Um, but it also helps with these foams that are really soft and bouncy. It adds yeah. a little bit of stability and firmness to the shoe as well. You'll actually bring a, a unique perspective. Maybe I, I don't know that I know anyone else who was in this space um, dating back to 09. When Born to Run happened, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Chris McDougall, who I've had on the podcast before, very enjoyable guy, fantastic writer, meaningful book to this culture. But the, everything that you just talked about would probably give him uh, a heart attack. What? Well, <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing. Like, I, like I've run a race against Chris. And uh, really? we were doing the hat 50 K uh -huh. and he was wearing those sandals. <laughs> and during that time, his sandal lace broke. Uh -huh. So I remember running past him as he's trying to figure out how to tie his shoe back together. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right there. I'll say, you know, <laughs> I, was yeah. I was wearing shoes. Right. Um, <laughs> but no, I really like, I don't hate on people who enjoy sure. a natural thing, but yeah. I think that the other thing that you can see in data right now mm -hmm. is that these records are being broken and it's not because the shoes are doing the work for people. They are helping with yeah. like having more responsive foams and bounce and yeah. stuff like that, keeping your legs fresher. But it's really the, like I was saying, the recovery period, you're not down for three weeks after you run a marathon. Yeah. You do a hard workout. And you can come back the next day and have a good run. Like the foams are really helping people train harder, train longer, go higher yeah. distances, 
and hmm. longer. So, you know, I don't think it's a bad thing if someone wants, like I'm, I'm a big believer in mixing up your shoe rotation. Yeah. I personally am not going to go run barefoot or something like that, but if you're concerned and you yeah. want to add one day of going to the infield of a track and running barefoot in the grass, you know, just to kind of like feel your feet out and that kind of stuff. I can't hurt. Yeah. I, what you just said makes me think of, uh, I just watched a documentary the other day about steroids and, and sports and uh, not to say that I would equate the foam to steroid advantage, but my point was Barry Bonds, just because he took steroids, he still had to see the ball hit the yeah. bat. And then he still had to have really fantastic mechanics and form and to see that ball go where it went. So I'm not saying, uh, yeah, because it, it, it has not, I mean, yeah, maybe steroids gave him strength, hit it further. He still had to be a very good player in order to yeah. do that. So I'm not making uh, the case uh, for steroids, but. Hey, go get yourself a pair of alpha fly. See if you can break two hours in the marathon. Absolutely. You know, that's right. It's, it's not going to happen. The, yeah. I mean, it's funny. My personal um, PR is in a pair of Kimbaras, which I, mean, I don't know, know that if is. you're familiar with that shoe. Nope. It was Sakani's minimal shoe. So it's just a little slab of foam. There's uh -huh. not much much to it um they're almost extinct at this point um, really yeah but huh. the uh, i've worn super shoes i've done it. It, it i think that there is a slight advantage to locking into a pace and having that responsive feel and maybe mm -hmm. uh is it perception of like pace uh, yeah coming down like with your foot strike right but um I, it's there. I don't, I don't like people call them cheater shoes and this stuff. Just put them on and see how yeah, you, you go. Do. Try. Yeah, yeah. You'll feel better. And maybe, and if you can take a minute off your 5k or, you know, do that thing. Great. And I don't think it's hurting anybody. Yeah. And every, it's, everybody can get a hold of them. What do you know what shoe the woman? I'm sure you do. Of course you do. The woman who just broke the record. What was she wearing? Uh, I'm pretty sure that was the Evo one. It was. Yeah, I think, I think so. So, uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but in Chicago. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the Evo one. Does, does Terex have an equivalent to that shoe? Do they have something that's just like they're putting their, you know, best foot forward. This is as good as it can be right now. Do they have something that they, that they think is great? Yeah, I think they do. Uh, I think that, um, the one that we were talking about, the Agravic Speed Ultra, Mm -hmm. uh, the orange one with the and that's the one that Tom Evans wears. Is is he the one who won the yeah won Western the, States? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. That's he was he was testing that shoe out, and okay. it's a I like that shoe a lot. The thing about it that I would warn a little bit, so it's a little higher stack. Mm -hmm. It's got a narrow throat, so like in between the forefoot and the heel, that okay. kind of hourglasses in, mm -hmm. which for me, I did a um, little trail race in, in California in that shoe. Yeah. And it was like almost straight up a hill, turn around, run down. And it was a hill that the path was kind of made by cows. So it had like divots and stuff in it. Mm -hmm. I had to really concentrate on landing on my forefoot because hmm. I felt like if I landed a little bit back or on my heel, that pivot point would you be, would turn. which is great if you're a really fast runner Yeah, to get up there. I, not being a super fast runner, I'm, I'm, I love running downhill. So I'll pick up the pace on the downhills, but going yeah. up, I'm like, you know, if, if it gets past a 5% grade, I'm walking, you know, it's like, yeah. Oh yeah. Me too. You know, yeah. It's like <laughs> through it. <laughs> I'll save the energy, but, yeah. um, you know, so I do feel the shoe, it has all the benefits of the road shoe, the cushion, the energy return. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if that one, I forget if that one's plated or not, or has something. And I think it does. Yeah. Um, but it's not like, I don't think it's the same as the rods in the, yeah. Adidas product. but it felt great. I loved it. And they had a sticky tacky, uh, grip on the outsole. I thought it was a lot of fun, but yeah, it definitely could be an ankle biter. Yeah. When, so when I see those, that Terex line, I do feel like, uh, you know, it, it feels like Adidas. It still has, you know, beyond just the logo, there's something, there's like, a, 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 an essence of Adidas to it and Adidas -ness. Yeah. What, a, <laughs> what is, what is a Puma? What are the, like, what makes, what is their value proposition? What's their thing? Well, you know, what makes Puma Puma? 
You know, I think now the team that's working there is really invested in creating a product that they feel like people can win in. Yeah. And so they're going after wow. the people to, to kind of prove that, prove that out. And they're hmm. willing to take some risks. So uh, if you look at like their fast R that's on the road, it's yeah. a decoupled heel. It's weird looking. It almost looks like goat hoofs or something like that. But, you know, they're willing to try, which I, I commend them. They're willing to try some stuff that looks kind of far out. Like yeah. one of the fast R now has a, the carbon plate extends past the lip of the shoe. So it looks yeah. like it's got an underbite. Hmm. But it, it, some of this stuff is working, so I can't can't really say they're doing it wrong. Do, do you read that in any way, like so they're, that they're experiment that they're such an established brand, but they're in this role of experimenting? Maybe that goes back to what you were saying about them of like they're dabblers. So do you see? Yeah, what do you think about that? I mean, I would think that a lot of the stuff, if you're going to try experimental stuff, yeah, you're not thinking like you can, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work. Let's yeah. just give it a shot. And when you do that, some stuff is going to work, some's not. So, yeah. In that case, the dabbling would be, it, you know, like there was a a five K shoe that I never saw actually hit the market. Yeah. Um, so, and and I don't mean dabbler in their current situation. I think they're committed. Mm. I, what I meant was like they kind of phased in and out of running. Oh, uh, I see. Different different periods. Got it. Um, okay. Yeah, but hey, like. It is tough. Like you look at a brand like a Adidas that has a history and like example, the, this pro four mm -hmm. took almost three years to come out because they couldn't come up with something better than the shoe they already had. Wow. So their athletes were like testing. There were six iterations of this shoe before it actually came out. Wow. And their athletes test this stuff and they're like, we're not going to put something out until it's better, which is yeah. goes against the shoe industry which is every, every year. year you come up with, it's typically upper change. Yeah. Full redo upper change, full redo. So it's like, yeah, yeah you're getting a new shoe and, but it's not, it's not tremendously new. Interesting. What, what do you, as we sort of wind down a little bit, I'm curious. So in the world of trail, as you're well aware, you know, we've got brands like Speedland and Norda and these, shoes that are popping up. I mean, trails growing quite a bit, but you know, roads are also growing quite a bit. So you see these mega established brands from the, you know, dating back to the twenties, thirties, you know, the split and all this sort of stuff with Adidas and Puma. Is there anything in road like that? I mean, I see maybe Mount to coast has popped up. Is there anything new? Is anyone kind of dabbling on that level? I mean, there's micro lots brands? Of, yeah, there's lots of people coming into the space. I mean, right now it's an interesting phase where apparel companies are trying to create a shoe. So you have, Rabbit, Tracksmith, um, these different both, brands are like. What's I that? didn't realize that they were doing shoes. Have they already released them? Maybe I'm just yeah. not paying attention. Okay, yeah, you can get you can get the uh, Elliot uh, runner from Tracksmith, and hmm. you can get the Rabbit. I forget the name of their shoe, uh, but yeah, it's you. Can, they have a shoe now, so it'll be huh. interesting if those can make it. But yeah, there's we see a lot of brands like there's uh, 42. That there's uh, oh these yeah brands that, yeah that are coming up that are I think that barrier to starting a shoe company is smaller. And you mentioned uh, a shoe company I love Norda. I like yeah. I'll I love their shoes. I'll wear them on the yeah. trail. I'll wear them. You know, kicking around town. They're yeah, just a great great shoe. Do you wear and, that uh, that approach shoe? That was the one I almost bought recently, but I ended up not. But I've, I've heard great things about it. They are. They have the, are you talking about the O one, one the O two, 2 or the, uh, I, you know, it's like a slip on. It's not, it's like, oh, not like a true yeah. runner. O three. 3 Okay. Yeah. That, I'll tell you that fits snugly enough. You could really run trails in it if you wanted to. Um, really? Yeah. Huh. It's, it's got a nice fit. Um, I, I still like laces a little bit better and yeah. they're coming out with a speed trail shoe, their version <laughs> of a race day trail shoe. Yeah. Uh, it should be hitting early this next year. Oh, the, amazing. But yeah, Nick and Willa, if you want to get them on the show, they're Nick's great. Uh, he'll, he'll talk you about the shoe and then oh, that'd be a blast like where they came from. But they're, I think they're, it'll be interesting to see what Satisfy does because they're kind of maybe talking in some, there's some overlap on that Venn diagram of Satisfy and Norda. 
be very yeah. curious to see what happens. Well, it's it. They did a collab shoe together, but it does sound like Satisfy is coming out with their own shoe. Oh yeah, I think they're releasing it at the running event. Are you going to be okay. there? There we go. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was funny because we went and visited them in Paris while really? we were there for the oh, cool. Olympics. So nice. we went to their, uh, I guess their studio space where that they, little thing behind the gate back there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, That's cool. So and they didn't show us any shoes because right then they were launching the Hoka collaboration okay the latest one they did that makes sense yeah yeah I and mean, i guess they didn't I have it the other direction the uh, kevin and and uh their team there are you know dave dumbro and kevin they're yeah they're coming at the approach like if we're gonna without limits make the best shoe that we feel like we can make yeah this is what it is and you know that it does go to show you like i think Everybody says, ah, we're making the best shoe that we can make. Some people cut back on corners as far as like, okay, if we make the shoe, these materials, we're going to have to change these so we can price point it at a place. That's why right. these shoes are more expensive for the Norda and the Speedlands. They're mm. like, no, nah, we're just, if you want to buy it, buy it. If you don't, don't. But we're going to put the best components that we can into it. And this yeah. is the price. So yeah. I kind of respect that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, they're both former Baltimore guys, right? They were at Under Armour they were, for a while. I mean, they've been every they've been Nike, Under Armour, yeah. you know, all over the place. But yeah, yeah, they are as you know, I, I, be, a lot of people have been giving credit to Jean Marc Bajan and well deserved, obviously lately for his time at Solomon and and uh, North Face. But my goodness, those two guys have been at every major brand, maybe other other than those two. <laughs> you yeah, know, in their careers, well, you have to understand too the the industry is not huge, and yeah. sometimes they get contracted to help. When yeah. someone else has a problem, you know, yeah. so some of these people that, you know, in the industry who have brands, they may be consulting or helping, right. You yeah. know, dial stuff in. So it's, it's actually kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, once you get to meet all the characters, like how, how it all fits together. Yeah. Well, last question then here, rounded out on Puma versus Adidas. If you had to give me an elevator explanation of their value proposition, what, what's the value proposition for both of those two brands? I would think if I was, I mean, they're doing a good job in marketing, but if I, if I was marketing for Adidas, I would lean into heritage and mm. athlete stories and how they've helped the sport grow from day one yep. and really tap into that. It's in our DNA. It's the reason why companies like Nike exist because they, you know, he's fighting against these yep. more expensive shoes coming out of, uh, you know, Europe and, and stuff. So yeah. They, they play a major role in the sport and have been part of every aspect of every movement. Yeah. Yeah. From day one. These, and, and I would take the Jesse Owens and put that on my side. And, yeah. Yeah. And go from there. Um, <laughs> if I'm Puma, I would then have to counter that with that's great. We're the innovators. We are the ones who are going to take the sport into the next, uh, into the next mm. level. And, yeah. you know, I, I think that there could be an argument for both. I look at, uh, the Pumas lineup and they've got a shoe in almost every category. That's pretty solid. Hmm. I would say, I'd love to see what they're coming up with next for race day. Yeah. That kind of stuff. But yeah. overall they have a, a really good lineup. Adidas, it gets confusing. You've got the supernova line, the Adi star line, the, you know, Adi zero line, you know, where do, where do I fall into that is probably yeah. difficult for, and even ultra boost, where do I fall in as a consumer? Like, how do I decide what Adidas shoe is good for me? So I yeah. think that their noise, they could cut out a lot of some of the noise and really just lean into Focus. this is our running offering. Yeah. Thomas Newberger, believe in the run. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Uh, we'll put a bunch of links in the show notes to articles on your reviews on all this stuff. And, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and joining me from Baltimore today. Uh, that's great, Josh. I'm hoping, uh, one of these days I'll get back to the trails and maybe, maybe yeah. I can run next to you for a little yeah. while. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I can, if I can keep up, I'm, I'm sorely out of shape here. I'm, I'm trying to become a road runner right now. It's, it's slow going. I don't know. I think being a trail runner really does help your road running, but mm. yeah. I believe it. You know. I'm, it's coming along. I mean, Paris is, is a not too shabby of a place. It's just, you know, everything is hard in Paris to get from my door to a place that I can run. Every, everything's just hard. Whatever. Yeah. First world problems. 
Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know Paris that well. We had a fun time running around, but we just yeah. stuck to the Thames. Yeah. But, love it. Or not, not even the Thames. No, oh, the, the Seine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just go to London every day and run. Yeah. Much I, easier. It's easy. It's an hour train ride. <laughs> But uh, yeah, nice. Well, I'll be following along and everything you got going and I hope we cross paths in person. All right, great. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and I'm glad that Taylor can be a good resource for you. Oh man, he's phenomenal. Yeah. All right. Thanks, man. All right. I'll see you.